Hey everybody, um, Mrs. Neaton here, and I thought I would do a First Chapter Friday because it's been a long time. Um, so today I want to share a book with you called uh, The Girl, sorry, Girl in the Blue Coat by Monica Hess or Hesse. Um, if you uh, have been enjoying what we did third quarter, which was um, our study of the Holocaust and um, World War II and Anne Frank, um, this book will be right up your alley. If you are tired of that whole topic in that genre of literature, then um, don't worry. Our next First Chapter Friday will have absolutely nothing to do with um, with any of those topics, okay? Um, but uh, this one, Mrs. Dillman actually lent me because she knows that I enjoy historical fiction and whether or not we were um, you know, studying the Holocaust, I would have read this anyway. So this story takes place in Amsterdam, uh, 1943, and our main character, uh, she is not Jewish, but she her job basically is to uh, buy and sell goods on the black market so that she can support her family. Um, so that is a daily um, struggle for her. Um, and we know that from our study of this time period that if she were to get caught, um, she would be in incredible danger. Um, she would be incredibly... Um, uh, punished for that. Um, so along with that, she is also getting over the death of Boz, who is the love of her life. Um, and he died kind of unexpectedly. And also one of her routine uh, customers, she shows up at her house one day and actually finds out that this elderly woman had been hiding a Jewish girl um, in her home. And that girl just completely disappeared. Um, they know when approximately she disappeared, but they don't know how she uh, got out of the house without being seen, and they have no idea where she is now. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read the preface to you, and I'm going to read um, part of chapter one. Um, as you can see, and maybe here, uh, Franklin and Cece are playing in the background, so uh, just ignore them. And um, So feel free to just kind of listen as I read. If you don't want to, you don't have to, because we're not in school, and you don't have to do anything I tell you. Okay, so this is the preface. A long time before Baz died, we had had a pretend argument about whose fault it was that he'd fallen in love with me. It's your fault, he told me, because you're lovable. I told him he was wrong, that it was lazy to blame his falling in love on me. Irresponsible, really. I remember everything about this conversation. It was in his parents' sitting room, and we were listening to the family's new radio while I quizzed him for a geometry exam neither of us thought was important. The American singer Judy Garland was singing, You Made Me Love You. This was how the conversation began. Boz said I'd made him love me. I made fun of him because I didn't want him to know how fast my heart was pounding to hear him say the words love and you in the same sentence. Then he said it was my fault also that he wanted to kiss me. Then I said it was his fault if I let him. Then his older brother walked in the room and said it was both of our faults if he got sick to his stomach listening to us. It was only later that day when I was walking home back when I could walk home without worrying about being stopped by soldiers or missing curfew or being arrested, that I realized I'd never said it back. The first time he said he loved me, and I forgot to say it back. I should have. If I'd known what would happen and what I would find out about love and war, I would have made sure to say it then. That's my fault. Okay, chapter one. Hello, sweetheart. What do you have here? Something for me? I stop because the soldier's face is young and pretty and because his voice has a wink in it and because I bet he would make me laugh during an afternoon at the movies. That's a lie. I stop because the soldier might be a good contact, because he might be able to get the things that we can't get anymore, because his dresser drawers are probably filled with row after row of chocolate bars and socks that don't have holes in the toes. That's also not really the truth. But sometimes I ignore the whole truth because it's easier to pretend I'm making decisions for rational reasons. It's easier for, to pretend I have a choice. I stop because the soldier's uniform is green. That's the only reason I stop. Because his uniform is green and that means... That's a lot of packages for a pretty girl. His Dutch is slightly accented, but I'm surprised he speaks it so well. Some green police don't speak it at all. 
and they're annoyed when we're not fluent in German, as if we should have been preparing our entire lives for the day when they invaded our country. I park my bicycle, but don't dismount. It's exactly the right number of packages, I think. What have you got in them? He leans over my handlebars, one hand grazing into the basket attached to the front. Wouldn't you like to see? Wouldn't you like to open all of my packages? I giggle and then lower my eyelashes so he won't see how practiced this line is. With the way I'm standing, my dress has risen above my knee, and the soldier notices. It's navy, already tighter than it should be, frayed at the hem and several years old, from before the war. I shift my weight a little to the hem, so the hemline rides even higher, halfway up my goosebumps thigh. This interaction would feel worse if he were older, if he were wrinkled, if he had stained teeth or a sagging belly. It would be worse, but I would flirt the same way. I have a dozen times before. He leans in closer. The hair and graft is murky and fish stinking behind him, and I could push him in into this canal and ride halfway home on my disgrace of a second-hand bicycle before he paddled himself out. It's a game I like to play with every green police who stops me. How could I punish you, and how far could I get before you caught me? This is a book I'm bringing home to my mother. I point to the first parcel wrapped in paper. And these are the potatoes for our supper, and this is the sweater I just picked up from mending. What's your name? He wants to know my name, and he's asked it in the informal, casual way, how a confident boy would ask a buck-toothed girl her name at a party. And this is good news, because I'd much rather he be interested in me than in the packages in my basket. Hi, Nikki Baker. I would lie, but there's no point now that we all carry mandatory identification papers. What's your name, soldier? He puffs out his chest when I call him soldier. The young ones are still in love with their uniforms. When he moves, I see a flash of gold around his neck. And what's in your locket? I ask. His grin falters as his hand flies to the pendant now dangling just below his collar. The locket is gold, shaped like a heart, probably containing a photograph of an apple-faced German girl who has promised to remain faithful back in Berlin. It was a gamble to ask about it, but one that always turns out well, if I'm right. Is it a photograph of your mother? She must love you a lot to give you such a pretty necklace. His face flushes pink as he tucks the chain back under his starched collar. Is it of your sister? I press on. Your little pet dog? It's a difficult balance to sound the right amount of naive. My words need to have enough innocence in them that he can't justify getting angry with me, but enough sharpness that he'd rather get rid of me than keep me here and interrogate me about what I'm carrying. I haven't seen you before. I say. Are you stationed on the street every day? I don't have time for silly girls like you. Go home. When I pedal away, my handlebars only barely shake. I was mostly telling him the truth about the packages. The first three do hold a book, a sweater, and a few potatoes. But underneath the potatoes are four coupons worth of sausages bought with a dead man's rations. And underneath those are lipsticks and lotions bought with another dead man's rations. And underneath those are cigarettes and alcohol bought with money that Mr. Crook, my boss, handed me this morning for just that purpose. None of it belongs to me. Most people would say I trade in the black market, in the illicit underground exchange of goods. I prefer to my think myself as a finder. I find things. I find extra potatoes, meat, and lard. In the beginning, I could find sugar and chocolate, but those things have been harder recently and I can only get them sometimes. I find tea, I find bacon. The wealthy people of Amsterdam stay plump because of me. I find the things that we have been made to do without, unless you know where to look. Okay, so that's Girl in the Blue Coat, um, and stay tuned for the next um, First Chapter Friday. Hope you guys are doing well, I miss you all, and I'll see you soon, bye-bye.